Coming up next on Arizona Horizon. A new report is out today on what states can do to help children thrive. Find out more about what electronic devices you will be able to use during flights. And hear the story of how returning soldiers with mental trauma are being helped by service dogs. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Richard Rallis and for Ted Simons. A new report from the Annie E. Casey Foundation called The First Eight Years, Building a Foundation for Lifetime Success, addresses how states can help children thrive. The report shows problems children are facing and also points to solutions. Dana Neymark, president and CEO of the Children's Action Alliance, is here to talk about the report and how it applies to Arizona. Dana, thanks for joining us. Uh, so give us, the, this report is sort of the kids count report for the year. Give us a synopsis of what it says about the nation and what it says about Arizona. This report says the nation is struggling in terms of kids in their first eight years. And we now have longitudinal data showing that a large majority of third graders are behind in their cognitive skills, their social and emotional skills, and their physical skills. So what, what makes third grade such an important marking point? Third grade is really a benchmark time, and as you know, our state has really focused on third grade reading, and that's for good reason, that up until third grade, kids are really learning how to learn. They're learning how to read, how to be part of a group, um, sharing skills. After third grade, you're really expected to read to learn and to learn content. So that really is a turning point in education. If the nation as a whole is doing poorly, it seems that we've spent a decade or more of No Child Left Behind and trying to really ramp up uh, to solve this problem of, of kids not being able to read by third grade. What's happened? What have we missed? We've missed consistency and ongoing commitment. And so there has been a lot of talk, which is great, and attention to early childhood. But if you think about it, our attention kind of ebbs and flows and other things take over. And even just looking at Head Start, we have long waiting lists for Head Start. And that's uh, an area that we know really helps kids from low-income families start kindergarten so they're not behind. So our commitment has really lagged some of our conversation. Typically, we hear Arizona being uh, worse than the nation. Mm -hmm. Are we, we going to hear different news tonight from you? Well, we are behind, even further behind the nation. We have more kids living in low-income families, and we have fewer young children in preschool. And again, that means that more are starting kindergarten behind. We know that quality preschool is something that parents want. They want that to be available. They know it helps their children learn those social skills, learn how to be part of a classroom, and get those basic academic skills started. So, so it seems, I mean, I think uh, as people have talked about preschool or, or they sort of diminish it by saying, well, they're just doing arts and crafts and stuff, but it's that interaction of being away from mom and dad, being with other children. Right. It is the foundation. That's why this first eight years is so important. It is literally laying the architecture of the brain happens in those young years. And so how you're interacting with teachers, with caregivers, with the world around you, that is literally shaping your brain that will affect how you learn and succeed the rest of your life. It is critically important. And we know now business leaders around the state are recognizing that. And as we are raising our expectations in this state for educational success, business leaders have come together with educators, with early childhood professionals to say, how can we start early? We know that waiting until third grade is too late. How can we start early? Yeah, you're mentioning a group called Build I imagine that's an acronym. What does that stand for? BUILD is part of a nationwide network focusing on early childhood issues. And so in Arizona, we have the Greater Phoenix Leadership. We have the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, along with educators, nonprofit leaders, child care professionals. So we're looking at it from all angles. How do we do right for our economy, for our workforce, for our families? And everybody agrees we have to focus more on those early years. So uh, the business leaders coming into it are looking at not just third grade, but down the road, graduate level, uh, that exactly. they need workers to attract the jobs to, to, to fill their, their office. Absolutely. We hear a lot from the business community now that um, when they hire folks, 
they need a lot of help, they need a lot of extra training. And we hear from our higher ed folks that a lot of students who start in higher ed need remedial classes. So we know that our pipeline is not as strong as it should be all the way along. Do you think the business leaders will change the message you're given? Or I guess, will the business leaders being attached to this message help it win the day uh, when the legislature opens up again? I do think so. I think it's very important to have a broad coalition and to show that we're not just bleeding heart liberals. In fact, um, we are tough-minded economists. We are looking at what it means for taxpayers, again, what it means for the workforce, and meeting those educational goals that Arizona has agreed on. We have much higher standards for third grade reading. We want fewer dropouts from high school. How do we get there? The tie, and we've seen it nationally, and I imagine it's the same in Arizona, the tie between poverty and lack of cognitive yeah. skills. Yeah. What causes that? And, and what, what do you see on the street level here in, in Arizona? It's a whole combination of factors. So it's the fact that many poor families' parents are stringing together multiple jobs. They're under extreme stress because even with those jobs, they're having trouble making ends meet. They have trouble getting to work. They don't have books and school supplies at home. They don't have the time or energy to, or know-how to help their kids with homework. They don't, they're intimidated themselves about going to their children's school and getting involved. So there's a whole variety of factors. Often they're worried about safety in their neighborhood, in their area, and so they're focused on that. Or how are they gonna put groceries on the table? What's the next meal gonna be? If that's what you're thinking about, you're really not spending time doing the math homework. You're thinking about how am I going to feed my children to get through the week and the month. Are, are there some policy, uh, are there some policy ideas you want to put forth next year as the legislature opens up? Yes, and I think these will be long-term conversations. And what Build is recommending is we expand access to quality voluntary preschool for three and four-year-old children. And again, that's something we know that parents at all income levels want for their kids. And then also expanding mentoring for parents. Expand voluntary preschool meaning like free. Well, I think there's a variety of ways to do that. We haven't worked out the exact strategies yet, but I think certainly we need some state funding. We need to leverage federal funding. We need to leverage private funding um, so that we can make more opportunities available. And you mentioned another, another plan? Yes, expanding mentoring for parents. And there's a strategy called Home Visiting Services, which is, has a ton of research about how effective it is. And that is when mentors come into a family's home and so they're really helping the family with everything they're doing with their kids. And if we're worried about getting the next meal on the table, how do we address that and then be able to move on to helping the kids with homework? Yeah, so the mentor could come in and not only see how the home environment is, help the parent out, but see how the child is doing, step in if there's uh, some intervention that needs to take place. Exactly, yeah. and one of the impacts of those kinds of services has been increased employment among parents because they basically increase their confidence and their skill set, while they're doing better with their kids, they're also able to move up the economic ladder. Well, we'll see if this report uh, causes some, some minds to change uh, at the state legislature. I know you'll probably be down there in January every day. I appreciate you we'll joining us there. here this evening on Horizon. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. The FAA has approved expanded use of portable electronic devices during all phases of flight, including takeoff and landing. Michelle Donati of AAA Arizona is here to detail the changes. Thanks for joining us. Uh, 
AAA, we associate with cars, but AAA is also involved with all types of travel then, right? We are. We are an advocacy organization representing the motoring and the traveling public. So a lot of people do equate us with our roadside assistance and um, road trips and th things of that nature, but we're also a full-service travel agency. So when the FAA approved this proposal last week, this is something that we've been watching very closely um, because any change in airline uh, regulation or policy does require some attention, especially because we know that we're going to get calls from our consumers, AAA members and non-members asking questions about this, this new um, policy and what it means for them. And I guess, yeah, I mean, think of it with the interest of the traveling public. I guess it's the traveling public will decide whether this ends up being a good thing or not. But, but so far, people seem to be excited about the idea. So far, consumers do tend to be, or travelers can, are, are, are pleased with the idea. Um, you know, a lot of folks in the industry think that this has been a long time coming. Um, these regulations are replacing those that were put in place in the 60s. Um, and so a lot of people think that, you know, aircraft has evolved since that time over the last 50 years. Technology has evolved. Um, and so uh, a lot of the, the sentiment is that it's time for this change to take place as well. Um, as an advocacy organization, AAA's position is that uh, the number one priority needs to be safety. So um, if you're going to change a policy, um, as so long as safety is the number one priority, um, that is the, the most important thing when it comes to traveling and especially with air travel. So what will be the difference? Meaning we just won't hear that announcement saying please turn off your device as we taxi down the runway? Well, that is to be determined. So the FAA um, placing or approving this and in, 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 in really now putting it in the, uh, the court of airlines to take the next step. So airlines will now have to seek out approval um, from the FAA individually before they can implement the policies on their aircraft. So um, the policies may vary per aircraft in terms of what may happen or um, how the announcements may be put into effect but there are still some um, some uh, some 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 when it comes to the uh, personal electronic devices um, that will not be allowed. So there will be no voice communication allowed, no text communication allowed. Um, devices must be used in wire uh, airplane mode. So for example, if you're using an, an iPad, it would need to be in airplane mode. So because there are a number of stipulations with the new policy, AAA is hoping to see the TSA come out with an educational campaign that mm. can help alleviate consumer confusion. Because essentially uh, in airplane mode, a cell phone cannot send or receive information, it just can work as almost a, a audio or video device. Correct. So you could, you know, watch um, a downloaded uh, TV show or a movie if you wanted to, but again, it would need to be in airplane mode. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that consumers know how to do that with their devices. There are so many types of devices out there. So it's important that consumers are aware of um, a number of things with this, this policy taking place, uh, including that it doesn't take place immediately. Again, mm. um, we could see a few months go by, several months go by, but before airlines start allowing uh, the personal electronic devices to be used during all phases of the flight, including takeoff and landing. And it's airline by airline, not airport by airport. It's not something that that Sky Harbor decides or LAX decides, it is something that each airline decides? That is correct. So the airlines will individually have to seek approval through the FAA. They'll have to go through that approval process, be granted that approval, and then they'll be able to implement the policy uh, aboard their aircraft. If the FAA is already, because I imagine uh, just reading stories about this, that there's been tests run where essentially they have an iPad going and, mm -hmm. and a Kindle going and seeing if they disrupt the flight. So if the FAA has already decided this is safe, what do the airlines have to show the FAA that they're doing? The, the airlines will have to go through um, a safety application of sorts to gain the FAA's approval. So the FAA formed a committee um, that included all phases of the, uh, of the airline industry. So pilots, crew members, um, technology manufacturers, even passengers um, mm. in, in order to arrive at this decision. And so what airlines will be required to do is seek out their approval. They'll have to go through a safety process, uh, a safety screening process process before they can gain that approval and then grant that expanded use of those devices to their passengers. So essentially retraining of essentially the, the, the personnel on board uh, and I imagine a little bit of the script what they say is that FAA given or does each airline come up with its own 
well, message to the passengers? You know, again, that's to, that's to be determined because there are still some things that uh, we know that airlines are going to want passengers and, and as an advocacy organization, AAA wants to see passengers put those devices down and pay attention to crew members when they're giving safety briefings and safety instructions, for example. So That whole thing at the beginning that, that we all can recite by heart? Right, but it's something that you should pay attention to each and every time you're aboard an aircraft. So, um, you know, those types of things uh, will still be very important and so will likely be rolled into how the airline introduces its policy. And then also, it's important for consumers to know that if a crew member needs you to put away your portable electronic device, they can ask you to do so at any time. And so um, it's important to be a, a responsible traveler and listen to those instructions when they're given. And I guess we know the story of Alec Baldwin playing words with friends and getting in trouble with the crew for not putting it away when he needed to. We've heard a lot of those stories. Do you see this being something positive going forward that we are able to use this stuff? Um, you know, it, it's it's at this point, as you mentioned in the beginning, um, a, a lot of consumers are, are showing that they, they are happy about this change. Um, and, you know, as an advocacy organization, our, our priority is safety for travelers. So, um, so long as safety is that priority, then, um, then you know, as an advocacy organization, as a full service travel agency, AAA is okay with the change. And I guess this shows sort of the power of the traveling public because the airlines I imagine flight attendants were not asking for this change. It might, must have come from the traveling public that this was created? Um, you know, it's come from a variety of sources. It's been a topic that's been a pretty hot topic in the industry for um, the last several years, especially with the explosion of technology. Um, if you look at our society, it's just huge. There were two billion portable electronic devices sold last year. Some of the fastest growing uh, devices are the um, wireless uh, or the, the wireless iPads and, and mm -hmm. the tablets. Um, and so with that, uh, that that those are have become a traveler's best friend. I know that I, I never get on an airplane without my iPad. It is my best friend on an airplane. However, making sure that you are a responsible traveler is also important. So making sure you're paying attention to those safety safety briefings and the crew members when they give instructions is important. But um, you know, it, we'll we'll see how this plays out. We'll see how each airline um, implements the policy and, um, and 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 go from there. Yeah, because I imagine there's going to be times during a weather situation where they may say, put it away, and will the public be convinced, now it's important, this, this is real, we need to put it away. Correct, and you know, one of the things that's, that's kind of interesting is in the, um, usually during takeoff and landing, you're asked to stow your belongings, including those portable electronic devices, and the reason why that policy was put in place, it really didn't have um, a whole lot or everything to do with that device being on, but it was more of, during takeoff and landing, you want those things secured so right, that so nobody flying around causes the injury. It's more yeah. of a safety issue than anything else. And we'll see if the airlines start charging us for being able to use it during takeoff and landing, but I appreciate you joining us. Michelle Donati, AAA Arizona. Thank you. I jumped the gun. Every month we feature an Arizona organization working to help better the community in our giving and leading segment. Tonight, the week before Veterans Day, the focus is on returning soldiers. Arizona is home to more than half a million veterans. They include 150,000 who served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Many of them face multiple deployments. Transitioning from military to civilian life can be difficult, especially for those veterans dealing with medical issues. Producer Christina Estes and photographer Steve Aaron show us how an Arizona veterinarian came up with a plan to help veterans. 16-month-old Lucky is like most puppies. He is just full of energy. And he loves toys stuffed with peanut butter. Good boy. It's never easy to separate a dog from his treat, but in Lucky's case... Once you put on the vest, once you put on the collar, he knows he's going to work. Work means protecting a man who spent a decade protecting others. I did five tours to Iraq. In 2007, I was hit with a improvised explosive device, IED, and um, sustained injuries uh, from head injuries to knee injuries. After years of surgeries and therapy, Staff Sergeant Jason Bedori medically retired. I had a disconnect, I didn't know what to do. A bad knee was the most visible scar, while the post-traumatic stress and brain injury stayed mostly hidden, except from Jason's family. 
I always had to have my wife with me. Um, I don't go to the grocery store. I don't go, um, I hate traffic. So I take the same routes that I know won't have traffic. Jason was fortunate his wife understood better than most. She also served in Iraq. That's where they met. My wife does do a lot, spends a lot of her time taking care of me. So it's like she's taking care of two kids and my daughter and myself. Until Lucky came along. Someone discovered the lab mix in a dumpster and took him to a shelter where Jason adopted him. Through Soldier's Best Friend, uh, he was able to help me, um, I guess, come out of my shell. Soldier's Best Friend is a nonprofit that pairs veterans suffering from post traumatic stress disorder or traumatic brain injuries with dogs to be trained as service or therapeutic companion animals. Come. Jason and Lucky are halfway Come. through the program. They meet with a professional Sit. trainer once a week and join other Sit. veterans and dogs for public outings, visits to stores, restaurants, and the airport. Sit. Lucky's biggest job is to help calm Stay. Jason, especially during nightmares. He's there so I know that it's okay. Um, if I wake up from a dream or if I'm acting out the dream, um, he'll wake me up, he'll interrupt me, whether it's with his, uh, me wanting to pet him or him just rubbing his body against me, um, brings comfort. He's not going anywhere unless I'm going with him. <laughs> After months of training, former Army Sergeant Mac Piper and his dog Cal recently graduated from the program. It makes me really happy and proud because I was able to teach him how to do it and make him understand that he needed to do it, and it makes me feel safe because He's a good judge of character. While serving three tours in Iraq, Mac endured multiple traumatic brain injuries. He was also diagnosed with PTSD, and then just four months after leaving the military, Mac was hit while riding his motorcycle. The driver took off, leaving his bleeding, broken body on the street and stealing much of his eyesight. It's called bitemporal peripheral vision loss, and basically, it means that on my right eye, I can't see anything from basically the middle of my eye out and on the left side, the same thing, but from the left side. The brain injuries make it hard for Mac to concentrate and recall things. I'll ask my fiance what's going on for today and she'll tell me. And then five minutes later, I'll be like, so what are we doing today? Because. I don't remember it. I don't remember asking her. And then there are the angry outbursts. After my accident, they got to the point where I would roll down the window and start screaming at people that were not driving the way I thought they should be or, you know, walking down the middle of the parking lot when we're trying to drive through the parking lot and and things like that. And I actually had to have Krista explain to me, you know, we live in a state where people carry guns and they might not just shoot me they might shoot her too and that kind of that really made me want to get some help and 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 you know get make myself better cal is always there to calm mac and to watch his back we'll stop somewhere at the at the grocery store i'll be looking at a at a shelf or something like that and he'll automatically turn and face back and be watching the people that are walking by and making sure that people aren't coming up behind me and, and doing anything crazy. The idea for Soldier's Best Friend came from veterinarian John Burnham. Well, I wanted to uh, help military and I also wanted to help with our overpopulation of pets. About half the dogs come from shelters and rescue groups. The program has graduated more than 50 pairs but it's touched many more lives. Just the other night we had a graduation and I had a mother that has been the caretaker of this veteran and she put her arms around me and hugged me and thanked me because now she can sleep in because her daughter can take her kids to school now to where before mom always had to do that because the daughter was not willing to leave home. So those are the kind of stories we hear on a regular basis. Let's go, come on. If it wasn't for him, I don't know that I wouldn't have been shot at already. Good boy. I just, I didn't know how to thank him. He's, it's amazing.
Sounds like Soldier's best friend has more than one lucky guy. Yeah. Soldier's best friend offers training in Phoenix, Prescott, Tucson, and Sierra Vista. Thanks to volunteers and donations, there's no cost to the veterans. For more information, visit soldiersbestfriend.org. That's all for this edition of Arizona Horizon. Thank you for joining us. See you tomorrow night. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Virginia G. Piper Charitable Trust. Committed to changing lives and strengthening community through investments in nonprofits and strategic initiatives. More information at pipertrust.org.